We'll go ahead and get started. We've got a full agenda today with some very important items we need to cover. Uh, before we get started, like we always do, we'd like to open the meeting in prayer, and we're going to call on uh, Representative Williams, if he would, lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Oh Lord our God, we thank you first for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for those that have come. We thank you for the work that's being done. Keep us mindful that everything we do and say affects someone else. Bless us, Lord. For this, we will forever be grateful. For it is in the name of our son Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, the first bill we're going to call uh, is SB 183. Chairman Brandon Beach, Chairman of the Senate Transportation Committee, you uh, member to the members of the committee, you should have a substitute on this bill in front of you, substitute to how to Senate Bill 183. I believe it's LC 391687ERS. Um, just for the members uh, who were here when we heard this bill last week, there was some items of concern brought up with several from several people who spoke. Uh, centering around the idea of being able to collect the toll past an expiration date and also the concern about what the liability of the state was from a private entity. We have worked over the last week and I appreciate uh, Chairman Beach and I appreciate uh, CERTA's willingness to work on this issue to tighten this bill down to make it clear uh, where that liability rests and also to remove the section uh, dealing with continuing a toll uh, without an expiration date. That section's been removed from the bill. So um, at this time, we're going to call on Senator Beach to make any comments about the updated version and also our CERTA director is here. Well, first off, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you uh, for having us back. And, and Mr. Chairman, thank you for all your hard work on this with me and with CERTA. <clears throat> As you stated, we have taken out the expiration section. We've taken that completely out of the bill. And we've tightened up the, uh, the language on being the conduit for the private activity bonds. I'm going to let uh, uh, the director talk a little bit about that section. Uh, but then the uh, other piece of it that we did keep in is the procurement methods matching up to GDOT, the P3 procedures and procurement methods, which is a good thing. So, um, Mr. Yeah. Tom Tomlinson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, I uh, echo the senator's comments. Thank you so much for all your help on this bill. Um, Basically, this bill is cleanup legislation that has two parts. Uh, one the senator just uh, referred to is lining up the CERTA P3 procurement statute with GDOT. Uh, we, we work on P3 or public-private partnership uh, procurements hand-in-hand -hand with the department, and so we're essentially just adding cross-references in our code section to their code section, uh, strictly just the cleanup. Uh, the other piece, the piece that uh, you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, is the conduit issuer language. Uh, this legislation seeks to provide the state with simply another financing option for future transportation projects um, that are likely to be or are contemplated to be public-private uh, partnership projects. By allowing CERTA to be what is known as a conduit issuer of financing such as private activity bonds, um, conduit issuance is a financing tool. Uh, it allows for private developers <coughs> who are working on public transportation projects, uh, so projects such as the, like the Northwest Corridor, for example, uh, to access um, tax-free or favorable um, financing because they're working on a public works project. And how this works in the marketplace, the marketplace isn't just going to take the word of a developer that they should be able to get the benefits of these uh, tax exempt uh, private activity bonds. So they require a public entity to be the issuer, but we are just the issuer. Responsibility for repayment of this uh, type of debt would, would uh, rest squarely in the hands of the developer that is doing the project. This does not add on to the state's debt, nor does it add on to CERTA's debt. It is what we call non-recourse financing, meaning there's no recourse again against the state <coughs> or SRTA. Um, but they get this favorable tax treatment because the project itself is a public works project. Let me ask you a question, uh, Director. Mm -hmm. Currently, under current state law, 
uh, is it not true that we have had P3 abilities in, written into Georgia law since 2009? That is true. So today, under current law, CERTA or GDOT can do a public-private partnership and have done private-public partnerships already, including the 285 and 400 interchange, which will be the largest single DOT project in state history. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that one or the Northwest Corridor they compete for, which is the largest. Okay. Yes. And so the only thing that with the new draft of this bill that will change is it gives the ability of those private entities to do the bond through CERTA instead of going to another government created bonding authority in another state. Is that correct? That is correct. And in no way, tell me if this is correct, in no way does it increase, the legally, increase the liability that CERTA or the Georgia Department of Transportation or the state has um, with this change. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, the private activity bonds, that, that was the non-recourse part. Uh, it would not change the risk, financial risk exposure, um, does not increase with this type of debt. And in addition to that, is it also not true that this body, because of the Georgia Constitution, the gratuities clause, and, some other, and, and the fact that the Constitution says that we cannot um, give away our credit to another private entity, that we could not even pass a bill constitutionally that would allow someone to borrow on the state's credit um, without a change in the Georgia Constitution. Is that not correct also? Uh, and you may not know the answer to well, that, so. Uh, partially, um, the Constitution recognizes uh, certain types of debt. These private activity bonds would not be something that um, this, the General Assembly could pass because it's not a constitutionally recognized type of debt. This type of debt is something that an authority, be they like a local development authority or a state authority, uh, could issue, but to your underlying point, this would not invoke the full faith and credit of the state of Georgia, and and that is what the Constitution is trying to um, guard against. Okay, thank you. I have a couple of questions from other members, if you don't mind, uh, Representative Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would assume that these bonds are twenty-year bonds. Um, they can be a very length, more. Uh, but generally for capital construction, we, we tend to issue 20-year bonds. Hypothetically, let's say you're using them to purchase equipment. You purchase 50 buses or equipment for stations, et cetera. While we don't have the liability, what happens if a firm goes into default? What happens to the buses? Who gets those, or do you just say, this debt's gone and we're going to keep rolling? Tell us what happens beyond the legal talk of our whole harmless selves. Tell what really happens to that beautiful bus. Um, first of all, full disclosure, I consider myself a recovering attorney. I, I am a lawyer, but I will see if I can. Sounds like you recovered. <laughs> <laughs> um, whether it is, this is used for buses or for, say, the infrastructure, um, that is the paving and steel going into a highway project. If the developer who's responsible for repayment of, of this financing uh, was to not be able to do it, um, you have a number of legal uh, safeguards. Uh, this is where surety bonds come into place. Um, the risk that is is posed by them not being able to repay this is similar to the risk um, that would be there if a developer was to get a bank loan. Um, this in many ways would be a substitute if they're for going to a bank loan which might have a higher cost of financing which ultimately raises the overall price of the project that the state is paying them for for construction. So um, put more uh, simply, I would say the project can continue forward. We do still require them to have um, bonds and other backups. And the safeguard against someone being uh, not a, a 
financially stable entity is that the marketplace, because these are still bonds that, that are sold on the marketplace, the marketplace uh, would not likely buy these bonds if they were worried about the risk. Because the marketplace knows they cannot look back to the state or to other revenues of SRTA for repayment. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Go, go ahead, one more. I appreciate what you said, but there are many instances of folk who were very stable 2008, 2010, crashing. And, and I'm still trying to clarify what happens. Somebody owes somebody some money who can't get paid now. How does somebody be made whole? See, I've got a church that they let us have the money on good faith. And bank knows we're going to pay. But if we don't, somebody else is going to have a church. Tell me what happens. Got, Representative Williams, I've got a, um, I have asked someone who has nothing to do with this process here, but he's a partner in a bond firm here in the Atlanta area and Savannah that does these types of bonds. So I've asked him if, if we could to let him maybe walk us through and we'll get to the other questions because um, he may help answer some of these other questions. But Mr. Woodward, again, is a bond attorney. Other attorneys will tell you this is a very specialized area of the law. He understands it very well. His father also was a bond attorney, uh, so he grew up doing this. Um, but I would like to him to walk us through, um, I would like for him to walk us through a scenario so we, the committee understands how this works uh, and maybe take the 285 and 400 interchange, which is a private-public partnership that was bonded, uh, and if you would, just walk us through how that works. Talk about how the repayment is done, ha what happens if someone goes in default, and answer those questions that you know the committee has, if you would, Mr. Woodward. Okay, sounds good. Is this on? Can yes. You hear me? And, uh, again, Jim Woodward, law firm of Gray Pinnell and Woodward, and I'm a, I guess I'm a non-recovering uh, <laughs> a, a lawyer. I haven't gotten out yet, but uh, I've been doing it for a while, and I'll be doing it for uh, several more years, hopefully. Um, uh, as a bond lawyer, uh, we represent the state of Georgia for their bond work. We represent county, city, school districts, all types of governments uh, in connection with these transactions, uh, you know, any type of governmental transaction. So that's kind of my background. I'm also the, the chair of the uh, P3, state P3 guidelines committee. Uh, I developed guidelines uh, last year that I presented to local governments uh, for approaching P3 uh, projects. So that's kind of why I was asked to be here and kind of go through this process. Uh, also, uh, I represented uh, Sandy Springs and, and Dunwoody. Uh, in connection with the 4285 project uh, uh, that was uh, bid out, uh, you know, two years ago uh, for for part of a P3 project, uh, I guess I can go through that project and kind of what uh, you know what, uh, what those two cities had to review and, and things like that, and then go through the structure. Any questions y'all have? Oh, yeah, oh, definitely, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that, that helps. Uh, and direct me any way you want me. Uh, I'm here for uh, any questions y'all have. Uh, so, so the bonds, uh, so. In Georgia, obviously, you got uh, something called a general obligation bond. Uh, the state of Georgia does those once a year. Uh, also, every city, county, school district has the power to do general obligation bonds. Those are full faith and credit bonds. Uh, typically, they require at local level a voter referendum, go through several steps. Those are tax backed bonds, and they have to go for governmental projects and things like that. Uh, the other form of bonds are something called revenue bonds. Uh, revenue bonds, uh, the most common source, uh, you know, of the first type was water and sewer revenue bonds, secured by a revenue source. Uh, the, the authority uh, doesn't have any taxing power. Uh, most water authorities, sewer authorities, or other type of authorities, which are governmental entities separate and distinct from the state of Georgia and separate from uh, uh, any city county, including this, you know, uh, sort of, uh, you know, t no taxing power. So all they can do, uh, if they issue bonds, they all have the power to issue these revenue bonds. Uh, all they do is uh, pledge any revenue source that they have. Uh, so for this transaction, and this is kind of similar to a couple of uh, other transactions, uh, uh, if a uh, private developer uh, uh, wanted to uh, participate in a P3 project, that was a state authorized P3 project, uh, they had to have the option to uh, uh, get financing for that project for their obligation to build the project and provide it to the state in this case. It's their obligation to do that uh, using this authority. And so that authority would issue a revenue bond. Uh, it would be a limited obligation, uh, which is in, the, is in this latest uh, bill, uh, non-recourse uh, debt to the authority. Uh, so those bondholders uh, could be, you know, sold out to the public or be placed with a private bank, uh, private placement, what those are called, but someone that's willing to lend uh, this authority money. Uh, the only security they have 
is what's pledged to it. And that's uh, it's a limited obligation of authority, so no, no authority dollars. Uh, authority has no power to, uh, to uh, pledge the state's uh, money. They have to look to whatever uh, they have. And what they do is they pledge a, a contract payment from this developer, and that's it. So if there's ever a default, say that uh, uh, that developer or that LLC that's being created, or whatever it is, that entity that's the private por portion of this, uh, if they go in default or they don't pay or whatever reason, the sole recourse that those bondholders or that bank is that developer. And uh, exact same concept for, uh, you know, in 2009 when they, they started these P3 projects, uh, instead of giving them the option to do a, uh, you know, a financing through a public authority, what was, what was thought of back then uh, was that they would go out there and get a bank loan. Uh, or get equity investors or anything else to finance it and then provide the project to the state. And once it's provided, it meets the requirements of that contract between the state and that developer, the state would pay the money for that you know, job performed. And that's it. Um, the only difference here is that, um, uh, and this is, came up with that, that 285 and 400 project, and that's why we wanted to add it here, is, is that uh, that particular developer for that 285, 400 project uh, they found a way uh, to, to use a Wisconsin authority, which has powers throughout the United States, uh, to issue a tax exempt, federally income tax exempt bond uh, um, uh, to finance their project. Uh, that bond that they sold, you know, was issued by this Wisconsin authority, it's called the Public Finance Authority, uh, and the sole security is this, that developer. Uh, same security as if that went, uh, group went to a bank or equity investors or someone else. Exact same risk, that same security, <coughs> Uh, the only difference is they ran it through this authority, and the reason why they did that is that the IRS uh, states that no private group can go out and get a tax exempt, federal income tax exempt bond by themselves. All tax exempt bonds have to be issued by a governmental entity of some sort, and, and that's the only reason why they use that public finance authority. It's a governmental project. Uh, it qualified to be tax exempt under IRS uh, codes, uh, uh, and, but it, they had to meet that one requirement of getting the government authority to issue it and then uh, provide the funds to finance the project. And so, so the thought here, uh, that same idea, I think uh, other folks had the exact same idea, uh, idea I, I had. Uh, but when I was going through this, uh, uh, you know, I had to explain why a Wisconsin authority was, uh, you know, uh, doing a project in Dunwoody and, and, and Sandy Springs. So I had to review that authority's uh, legislation, make sure they had power to do this. Uh, they had to go get consent from local governments, uh, so they get consent from, you know, I think Fulton County, from, you know, all the cities that this project is located in, uh, but they had the power to do it, and they issued these bonds, uh, they, you know, they charged their fee, but they did a project in Georgia, and so, uh, so my thought, and I think other people have the same thought, if these are Georgia projects, you know, finance, you know, for, for state Georgia highways, uh, we should probably have an authority that can do this instead of a Wisconsin authority, and so that's the same, that's the reason for doing this. Um, but again, this authority is purely a conduit. You know, again, uh, it doesn't have the power to levy a tax, so they can't pledge any taxes. It doesn't have the power, and, and the statute, the uh, current statute for CERTA, there's a section there that says that it has no power and all bonds issued uh, you know, cannot you know, pledge the credit of the uh, state, and so that's already in the statute, nothing changed, that's been there for a while. Uh, and so all they do is, uh, all they can do for these P3 projects is just uh, provide the revenue source, which is purely the, you know, a contract payment from, the, from this developer, and that's it. So that's kind of the background there. If there's a default, uh, they, go against the, um, they go against the developer like any other bank loan would do if there's no, no tax exempt bond. Let me ask you this question. If, so this legislation, you've reviewed the legislation. Mm -hmm, that's correct. It does not change any liability that's currently on the state today who's already doing P3 projects and have had the legal ability to do it since 2009. Is that correct? That, that's correct. And I, in, in being involved in, on a board of a local bank, sometimes someone will come to us, it may be a contractor or it may be another type of business, and they want a loan. And one of the things that we look at is the repayment structure, right. uh, how it's going to be repaid. And one of the items sometimes we may look at is they have a contract with an entity to provide a service, and they will pledge the revenue from that contract to help pay back the loan they're getting from us. In this particular case, these entities, if they're doing a P3 project, they've um, it was went through a public bid process. Mm -hmm. That uh, award has been made in a public meeting by in, in a public place advertised under current law. They are awarded the contract to build this road, this lane. Um, they go out and they, they're pledging that contract they have with the state 
for that revenue to this project. Mm -hmm. Now, as a bank board member, if that person goes in default, I cannot go and take away the property that the person uh, that this contracts with. I, I don't, I, that my deal is not with them. They did not sign the contract. They didn't pledge anything. The only thing I would be able to get is the revenue coming from that contract and that's it, correct? That's correct. It's the same way in this situation. That's right, exactly. Yeah. So that's, uh, I wanna, Representative Jones. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I certainly wanna thank the Senator and the gentleman with CERTA for working with the House and coming up with um, um, a way of just eliminating some of that language that was a little of a concern. For example, non-recourse uh, non financing, the liability issue is gone. You guys can issue the bonds as opposed to them doing it somewhere in Wisconsin. And at the same time, I think taxpayers are protected because if it does default, um, it, it doesn't come back to our taxpayers. It's the the private piece of it. And so P3s are very common, and it's just a creative way we can get things moving. So Mr. Chair, I, I clear, clearly support it now at the appropriate time. If I can be recognized as a motion for the substitute, Mr. Chair, I'd like to. All right, we'll come back to you. Uh, Representative Deffenball. Yes, sir. Um, just a, not, not so much on this bill directly, mm -hmm. but are the bond buyers for these projects? Are they gonna use the AAA rating of the state? Nope, uh, no. so, uh, so uh, if it's publicly offered, you get a rating for these transactions. Uh, only thing the rating agency would look at would be uh, security for the bond, which would be the developer. Uh, so uh, so the developer has his own rating, it has to be a pretty large developer to have it. Uh, uh, they would assign that rating to these bonds uh, or the security source. More than likely, most developers don't have a rating. They're not rating, you know, they're not a level high enough to have a rating, they have enough resources. And so it'd be a, uh, you know, it'd just be either you can get a bond insurance policy or, or some other things to help the marketability of the bonds, but they would not be AAA bonds based off state of Georgia's credit. And they would have no effect on Georgia's bondability, bonding no. ability. Correct, doesn't uh, go against any cap or anything along those lines that the state of Georgia has. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Representative Garner. Thank you very much. I th I'm just trying to get really <clears throat> comfortable with this non-recourse loan. I understand that part of it. If, if we have a, have a private developer who comes up with one of these um, loans for a public project, I was wondering what happens if they go bankrupt or they decide it's too expensive and they walk away. And there is a surety bond that is adequate to finish the job? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, correct, so, so under the uh, 2009 uh, uh, P3 Act, that's already in place, uh, you know, the, the requirements is a, there's a pretty large vetting process uh, um, uh, where you know, if, if the state does, uh, determines there's a need and it's not presently funded from other sources, uh, they can put it out to RFP, uh, nine day RFP, there's a notice requirement, uh, there's public hearing requirement, uh, they have to vet all the uh, uh, bidders and they can uh, you know, go down to two bids. So there's a whole, whole process in place already to make sure that it's a qualified developer. And so the whole process is started by the state for this. It's not a developer with a great idea approaching the state. Uh, so it's, it's, we got a need and, and, and we're not gonna finance it through our own state dollars. We wanna use this P3 process. So that's already in place and that's, that was there to basically make sure there's no developer that's gonna, you know, from the start not be able to do it. Uh, but, but also in that same statute, uh, once a, a developer is selected to do the project, there is a surety bond requirement in the statute before, uh, before you can give, provide the funds or, or enter into this contract with this developer, uh, they have to have a performance bond on, in place. So these projects all re always seem to cost more than we thought they were going to cost? Uh, sure, sure, and, and so uh, all projects do, uh, as we know. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, and this is more just talking generally about P3 projects. Um, it's a concept that works. Uh, you know, it started. It works really well in some other nations. England you know, has done really well, good job with this. Virginia uh, has done some of these as well. So this concept's coming up. Part part of the P3 arrangement is is putting the risk of a project, meaning overruns, over onto the private side instead of the public side. Oh, Obviously, that if it's a public project, they uh, incur all risks. All risks and all payments are on the government. So part of part of a, whether a P3 transaction works or not. Uh, uh, you know, is, is, you know, take that risk of being built if, in, on the private group. Private group says, we can do this, uh, and, and we do it on time, uh, you government owe us money. And so they don't perform, 
they don't build it in time, they go bankrupt or is not built to standards, uh, that contract, and this is a purely a development agreement between the state and its developer, will have provisions saying you didn't provide us this thing on time. It's kind of like if you build a house, you didn't build us the house we wanted, we're not going to pay you for it or we're going to pay you less. And so it's purely based off that concept. So if it's, it's not built on time or they don't perform, then it's just a purely a contractual relationship. Uh, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Chairman Rinders. Thank you so much. And I'm a little familiar with the bond issue, and she took some of my thunder on the cost okay. overrun. It's not as easy to say you didn't deliver on time. Mm -hmm. sure. I'm sure you're aware of many times in which the bonded project costs more than what, and we, and we continue to pay into that. Right, right. Would you disagree with that? Oh, I, I agree. You know, all, all projects. All, all yeah. pro we keep paying. Uh, so, that, to, so to say, if I may finish, Mr. Chairman, so to say that we just come back and simply just say, hey, you didn't meet your obligation. It really isn't that simple because we continue to pay it. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I guess. Yes. It, well, y yeah, well, yes, if it's a. <laughs> yes. Now, <laughs> in terms of the marketplace in a 20 year bond, mm -hmm. how do we look at the viability of the contractor 15 years from now mm. on a 20 year bond? That they're still going to be credit worthy. Mm -hmm. When the bond's already been sold, how do you factor that in? Uh, and so this is well, uh, it's kind of beyond my, my, my scope, but I, I can I can I can guess. Or I can and and finally, Mr. Yeah. Chair, if I may, on one more question, I'm trying to find a way to. I just want to make sure I understand mm -hmm. on projects like the Big Dig in Boston, sure. or the cable car in Atlanta, mm -hmm. both hypotheticals. Mm -hmm. But in questions like that. I want to know from a DOT perspective, if we got into a situation, is there anything that prohibits because we passed 170 a couple years ago? We sell bonds every year in the budget. Is there anything that keeps CERTA, who has that responsibility, or DOT from taking money that we were anticipating in another part of the state from saying because of those cost overruns, we now have to help the contractor in paying off here? Is there anything that keeps that? from happening, that the 170 funds that we did a couple years ago doesn't use because, like anybody else, we made a bad loan or mm. a con contractor didn't meet their obligation or the cost overrun that protects the rest of the state from those kind of unintentional. Uh, and I can't answer that. In, in the current version of this uh, bill, uh, there's a section there that provides limited obligation of the authority. So I'd like the author, can sort of go back and say, DOT, we need more money because this intersection cost us more than what we thought 10 years ago when we gave somebody a 20-year bond? Yes, right. sir. Um, if go I may, ahead. Mr. Chairman. This type of uh, financing isn't uh, increasing or decreasing uh, the risk of, of overruns. In terms of the risk that you mentioned, though, this statute is about making that developer solely responsible for the cost of, of that money. It does not change um, the, the finally um, uh, bid or, or negotiated price of the contract. Um, they run that risk. And, and I think building on that point and, and the question from Representative Williams, the project itself is not pledged as collateral uh, for, for this debt. And in terms of your, um, uh, your first question as far as um, how do we look at or gauge 15 years from now the, um, the financial viability of the contractor, um, if I'm uh, paraphrasing that correctly, I, it's my opinion that um, the fact that we're relying on the market to see if somebody, they're not forced to buy these bonds. But if they, if the market feels, since the only place they can look is back to that developer, if the market is comfortable with that risk, uh, in my, my opinion, that is a better test of their viability than us inside of government saying that they're definitely going to be here. Because we're not the ones making that judgment and we're not the ones taking the risk of repayment. The, the market is whoever buys those bonds. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I, my, my, my point is simply is we're trying to predict market that nobody can do. We're trying to predict cost overruns that we really don't know how much that's going to be. And all I want to do is make sure that the very thing that we asked members of this body to do a couple of years ago, which is put faith and trust in, 
on 170 that we're going to turn around and spend those dollars appropriately. I just am a little cautious about making sure that we don't have expenditures going out for things that we can't predict. Thank you. Let, let me just ask this follow-up question. Nothing in this legislation changes CERTA's ability or the Department of Transportation's ability to do projects they already have the ability to do. Is that correct? That's correct. So you can do all of these projects today. The overrun issue is an issue that you have to tend, contend with today. We're not allowing any additional projects to be done. In addition to that, and I may be wrong about this, so I want you to correct me if I am, typically in P3 projects, when we bid those projects, when we seek public bids, that developer is giving us a number that they agree to bring that project in at. They're then responsible for all overruns in that project. Is that right? That is correct. So that's different than the traditional bid that I may go out and do where I agree you're going you're gonna to resurface this road and they come back and say, well, we ran into rock or we ran into this problem and I'm just paying them as they go. So we, we end up with either, in the, in the case of a 100% bid project, you end up with a fixed price. Right. In the case of a P3, you may end up with a negotiated price. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain conditions where it could change the cost. What we're talking about here is um, providing a mechanism which can hopefully allow them to access cheaper money because it's tax exempt so that their bid prices, their initial prices are lower. Okay. And, and again, but the risk if they um, can't repay it is on them and not on uh, the state in the way it is with general obligation bonds. Right. So. And, and also again, going back to the same underlying question, there's nothing that we're considering today that increases that liability on the state. That's correct. Right. Um, Representative Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two simple questions. Yes or no? The first one is, will the state, um, I want to make sure that the state would not be on the hook for the loan or accepting debt on paper for what is essentially a contractor. Yes or no? Uh, yes, the way you said it, that's, that's correct. That's, that's correct. That's we would not be doing that. And second, will these bonds take up any part of the bond issues that we do in our budget every year? And no, they will not. They are not part of the uh, state's bonding capacity or ceiling. Thank you. All right. Um, Representative Harrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, to the author, I appreciate the modifications you've made. They've been very helpful. Thank you, Director Tomlinson. Uh, you've answered the questions very well. Um, though a different authority, um, the House recently passed, which is four no votes, another revenue bond issue a few weeks ago with regard to the Georgia World Congress Center, which is also not a liability to the taxpayers of Georgia, also does not impact our bonding ability or a threshold solely on the revenue uh, generated by uh, that authority. Um, the risk of uh, doing it the traditional way with the general obligation bond, all those costs and overrun fall on the taxpayer. So um, I, I think this is a, a, a great improvement to the measure uh, in the substitute. Uh, it's a, it's a, a way to uh, to finance projects, to move them forward, to have a greater participation in our private sector, to be able to negotiate better costs, and better, uh, better outcomes, and at the same time uh, protect the taxpayer. So uh, as Representative Jones mentioned earlier, I, I think it's been very uh, well prepared and the questions answered and at the appropriate time uh, we'll join with Representative Jones in moving this measure forward. Thank you. Representative Jones has a question and go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Representative Williams, I believe. Sir, for clarification, I don't oppose this. I, I know we, we need it, but I think that it's incumbent upon us as representatives because while I represent the state as a state representative, I represent breathing people back home. And when, John, when Janie Q. Housewife, who's worked as a teacher, buys bonds because it's a state of Georgia project, she buys it because we have convinced her we are the best state in the union to do business. And when she loses because somebody defaulted, no, the state does not lose. But those bonds become worthless and somebody has lost some money because we did not ask enough questions to clarify. 
State walks away clear. I'm happy about that. But how do I feel about that retiree that has now invested in bonds and somebody's going to bet because somebody's going to pay? And I just want to make sure that we've done everything we can to protect not just the state of Georgia, but its citizens also. Because if there's a default, no, we don't owe a penny. But somebody got some stuff that they can just paper the walls with because that's what the bonds would be worth. Rep Rep Representative Williams and, and Mr. Woodward, you correct me if I'm wrong on this because you're an expert in this area. The way this process would work is the state enters into a contract on the 285 and 400 interchange. The state agrees to pay a private developer a specific amount of money per year based on the bid that's accepted, again, a public bid, accepted in a public meeting. We agree to pay for the next 20 years, and I'm just going to use this as a round number, $1 million for 20 years. The private developer goes out and gets a bond from CERTA or some other entity. That is sold on the bond market, and those bond that the, the folks who are buying that are not getting a Georgia bond. They're getting they're, that's not who's standing good for it, and they know that. They know who who the bond is. Now, but if they default, if they do not pay, that money is being paid into a trust. So the money that Representative Williams, you, the money that's being paid into that tr that it, by d the DOT or CERTA every year is being paid into a trust. That is being held and protected. So the state's obligation remains, whether the company is there or not, to, to pay that contracted amount they agree to on the front end. So the bond f individuals are being protected because the state is obligated, CERTA is obligated to, f up to live up to their contractual agreement they make as part of the public bid. Is, is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So, this, the state is obligated only to the amount they've contracted with during the public bid process on that project. That's correct. Okay. All right. Seeing all questions, I don't see any other questions from members. Again, you have in front of you substitute to Senate Bill 183 LC 391687ERS. Um, at this time, it would be appropriate for there to be any motions. Representative Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, I appreciate the opportunity for us to vet this issue. It is important, and I, I'm glad that the taxpayers will not be held responsible, but the private developer will. And because of these are revenue-generating bonds, that puts it in a different light, too. So with that being said, um, thank you again, Senator, for all your help. And I'd like to make a motion that we uh, move on to substitute LC 3916767, do pass. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second, number 29? I'd like to ask a parliamentary question. On, did he say these are revenue bonds in I his believe, motion? I believe he's incorrect with that statement. But okay. Well, I know we got a motion uh, based on his motion of being a, a revenue bond. Parliamentary inquiry. Parliamentary inquiry. Go ahead. Inquiry, Mr. Chairman, are these revenue bonds that are stated in the motion? If not, I'd like for, the, for Mr. Jones to kindly correct, state the correct motion so we're not voting on something inadvertently. Go, d director, they're not revenue bonds, correct? I don't think that's the correct legal term. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, uh, yeah. Chairman Graham and the party. Uh, actually, I was thinking about a poll when the revenue yeah, was this is a poll, 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 so I'm sorry. But let me, let me restate my motion uh, that we, we have a do pass on LC 391676S. LC nine one six eight seven ERS. Am I looking the wrong one? Then? Yeah. Okay, got you here. I'm sorry. One six eight seven right here. ERS. Yes, Mr. M Mr. Chair, um, the Senate substitute to eight B to one eighty three LC three nine one six seven eight seven ERS. All right. Do we have a second? We have a motion. We have a motion. We have a second. We have a motion and a second. First of all, let's take any discussion from the, uh, any other discussion from the committee. All right, I will allow public comment uh, on, on this uh, substitute. Garland. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think there's about three people signed up to uh, speak on this. And first of all, I want to I commend you for, appreciate how much work you've done on this bill. And, um, um, trying to sift through it. It's been very difficult and complex. I just have a couple of really quick comments. Um, I'm trying to reconcile the testimony 
with the bill language that I've heard today. I've just looked at this bill because it's just come out. Um, the, I'm assuming that we're talking about line 88, which says that, uh, used to say taxpayer, we were going to extend credit. That's been reworded somewhat, extending to private organizations and individuals. Um, these organizations and individuals could be unqualified. I want to just point out to you, uh, the committee, that this is inconsistent uh, with GDOT policy. GDOT policy doesn't extend this kind of credit or get into these kinds of agreements with uh, contractors, and they also financially qualify their contractors. There's nothing in this language right now that uh, qualifies any of these people. So if you could have a private individual with a DBA account that's open for transportation, and they're qualified for credit enhancement under this language as it exists in the bill right now. I would ask you to consider uh, changing that. Um, it also is worded so that it allows the private party to acquire land that's used for a public road. Don't know why we would have a private party acquiring land that is uh, going to be used for a public road. That doesn't make sense to me. The other section I just wanted to point out very quickly, is also in section two, um, that legalizes, I'm sorry, it um, uh, removes the, uh, eliminates the competitive bid requirement. Uh, there's no, I don't see any justification for eliminating that competitive bid requirement. There was um, no completed projects have been cited that show that GDOT's value engineering is more cost effective than the competitive bid process. In this case of CERTA, CERTA is directly taxing the people of the state of Georgia versus GDOT, which allows their, gets their funds and to be appropriated through the legislature with legislative control. The citizens are opposed to removing that competitive bid process. So, uh, because they're the ones that are paying for the tax uh, directly. So I would ask you to consider those two sections and I thank you for the opportunity to comment on this. I think uh, there was one other uh, or two that had signed up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Hank Sullivan. Yes, sir. Appreciate the opportunity to come down here and speak with you this afternoon. Uh, the bill that I was coming to speak about was the one that was offered last week, and I was not able to come, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to come down here and speak on this one. Just receiving it, so it's Im about impossible for me to have researched everything about the changes that are in this bill, but doing a spot check on this, uh, the first thing I would say is that with regard to the state of Georgia, I would be very leery about entering into public-private partnerships as just an ongoing way of doing business because it is the state, it is a government uh, entity here we're talking about, owned of, by, and for the people. The state itself uh, owes a, a debt to the people to remain clear of any um, possible way that that uh, crony capitalism could enter into the decision-making process here. And this, this kind of project, so, so these kinds of projects, the, I would say that the only reason why you would undertake a, a uh, public-private partnership is if there's no other way to do this and it is in demand by the people of the state. Secondly, the way I understood it before was that the state of Georgia would create an authority. The authority had no assets. The authority then would issue a, a uh, public bond referendum to, to gather funds that it would then loan to private concerns in order to generate uh, the funds necessary to build a toll project. Well, and at the end, there was no end to the toll. Well, that was the most egregious thing about about it to begin with was that there was no end because, yeah, I would love that franchise to be able to come down here and, and, and bid on something and have an unending stream of income um, for my, con my, my company or for me personally, and that opens up again the, the opportunity for, for particular individuals to be chosen for these franchises. Now, I understand that that particular 
part of the of the bill has been taken out no longer could the tolls at least stated be operated in perpetuity but i see the changes in section one and i don't know the answer to this but i put it out there because i highly suspect that i know the answer to this it says in section one I, now the bill defines a project and at the very end, it says any pro that the change in the law would be that any project undertaken pursuant to a public-private initiative as authorized pursuant to Code Section 32278. Now, in 32278, does a public-private partnership allow for a project to go in perpetuity? Because if you took it out of the language over here, but then inserted that possibility that these tolls could be assessed against the, the users of the tollway in perpetuity, then you did nothing. I don't know the answer to that. When I get home, I will look it up and see, but I'm asking for the committee to look that up and see if we didn't just remove it here and insert it there. Um, to answer, this is, uh, I, I appreciate that you asked the question, you know, what happens to the assets here? The way I understand it is that if the contractor defaults and then that causes the authority default because the authority only has, it, it has to pay out the bonds. The bonds can't be paid unless they have the toll revenues from the contractor. Well, what happens here is that, that all of the assets then go to the state. So the state is created out of the air. They've created an entity. They have spun this into existence by using, by borrowing funds against people who are, are, going, are expecting to be paid. The contractor can't pay them. Well, rather than those people being paid off by, by liquidating the assets, all of that just goes to the government. Well, something about that doesn't seem right to me because you have people who are depending upon being paid the obligations that they have, and the assets are still there. Yet all that goes to the state. I don't understand that either. And really, that's it. Public-private partnerships, very dubious. Only if there's no other way to do a very needy project. And um, those are my comments. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Let me just say as you're sitting down that just so you'll, again, to make it clear, the money would still be paid by the Department of Transportation into the trust even if the company defaulted. So that's important to note. These are complicated. Uh, bond, these bond, bonds and this legislation is complicated to understand. That's that's one of the reasons I wanted Mr. Woodward to come because he had, he's an expert in this area. But Mike Scupin, I didn't. Excuse, could you answer one more question? Yes, sir. Go ahead. I will. And I'll be glad to stay around sure. after too. Where does the DOT get the funds? It's a contract from a public bid that would come through state dollars. So it would be like any other project. It's a competitive bid that's bid out in a public public forum. They enter into a contract with the private de person, developer. This is just at another delivery manner. But with, oh, if well, it's a DOT, then the, then the taxpayers, them, are at risk, are they not? Not not for the bond, no, sir. I'll be glad. I'll stay around as okay, long as you want you. to, but we're going to move along. Mr. Scapin, I didn't see you, Mike. You were hiding on me. <laughs> I'm sneaking in the back way. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you for letting us speak. I appreciate that very much. Uh, frankly, some of the questions I've heard asked today were really excellent questions. Uh, the questions seem to be a lot better than some of the answers that I heard given. Uh, another thing I'd just like to point out, I'm trying to testify about a bill that I initially really did not like at all, and I have not seen the bill now. I understand section three was removed, but that's about the extent of my knowledge on the bill. So it, it seems to me there may be a problem in the way things are being done down here, because I do believe that citizens should have the opportunity to see the bill before it goes before the committee to be voted on. I just think that's a fair way to do things. And rushing a bill like this through uh, it just doesn't seem to smack of the best way to go about it. Uh, 
you have to kind of question in my mind, why is the big rush on this? It's not like this is the last day of the session, so I, I don't understand that. Uh, I am concerned about what has been mentioned here today uh, about the RFPs, and I, that was in line 63 and 64, uh, where it refers back to the annotated code, which then you see in the annotated code, it allows simply for the Department of uh, Transportation or the authority or whoever's going to be doing it to request uh, proposals on the project. Now, that opens up the door for crony capitalism. There's no way around that. And that's exactly what that does. If, if uh, me being the authority or the DOT, whoever can go out and say, well, I'd like to get Bill's company and Fred's company to give us an RFP on this road that's going to go from uh, uh, Atlanta to uh, Chambly or wherever it's going to go, and they only bring in two companies. Uh, that's an option that's here as I read the bill, unless that's been taken out, and I don't believe it has. That bothers me greatly. Uh, the move to public-private partnerships, again, just opens up the door for crony capitalism. We're seeing that in our federal government, and I think most people do not like it. I do not like seeing the move down here under the pretense that we're protecting the people. There are much better ways to protect the people than to move into a public-private partnership, which is a move away from capitalism, which is what has made this nation great, to a move toward socialism and fascism. We don't need to be taking that step. There's no reason for it. There are much better ways to go about doing this than what I see in this. In listening to some of the comments, it seems like what this is about as much as anything, it's a sh move to shift around the Constitution of the state of Georgia in the way it points out monies are to be appropriated and spent by the state. And this circumvents that. That bothers me greatly. Uh, one more thing which was brought up, I'm not sure who the representative is down on the end down there, but he, he brought this up and that kind of triggered something for me. Uh, I like, if you're saying that, the, that these monies will be there to pay back the bonds, then I guess that is okay. But I'm, I was thinking when he was talking about what happened with General Motors and the people that had bonds in General Motors when our former president stepped up and took over General Motors and left all those people sitting out there that were holding bonds in General Motors with zero, nothing. And that bothers me greatly if this is the type of a situation that that can do. I would urge this committee to postpone this vote and do a little bit more digging into what this bill really allows to open up because I just do not think that this is the way that this committee and the state of Georgia really wants to move on these things. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll call the question, make sure there's no other discussion before we move to a vote. Any members discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the passage of substitute to SB 183 LC 391687ERS, signal by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, it passes, moves on to rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, next on the agenda, we're going to go ahead and do uh, call up Georgia Department of Transportation. We have to the members of the committee, we're going to continue to work, so we've got a lot to do today. Audience members, if, if you're not going to stay, please uh, go outside with your conversation. We do need to keep moving. Um, all right, if you'll recall, we had a joint meeting with the Senate Transportation Committee. At that time, the commissioner and Josh presented the 10-year plan as required by HB 170. Uh, at, we don't want to recap and go through the entire plan, but we do have Josh here to answer any questions. In addition to that, he also provided everyone with a um, flat zip drive um, that you should have with you. That contains all the backup data to the 10-year plan. So you also have an additional copy of the 10-year plan. You have all the backup data to the 10-year plan. And part of, our, uh, part of our requirements under HB 170 is to approve the GDOT 10-year plan on an annual basis. That's already been done by the Senate Transportation Committee. If any members have any questions from that presentation, we'll, I know Josh will be glad to answer them. Any members have any questions? Yes, sir. The issue does not surveillance. No doubt. 
<laughs> we have some questions up here. This is not a surve surveillance piece, is it? It's a it's a it's a P three project, Mr. <laughs> All right, we uh, we're going to. Uh, if there's no discussion at this time, it would be appropriate to take a motion to approve the GDOT 10 year plan. We will then send a letter to uh, Chairman England of the Appropriations Committee letting him know this committee has had this presentation uh, in a joint session uh, that we approve the 10 year plan. Uh, we are gonna make some changes to how that's presented next year, but uh, any information that you get off this that you'd like to ask questions, I know Josh or the commissioners always willing to help. One comment, Mr. Chairman. Go, go ahead. There's actually a table of contents for, for what's on the flash drive, just to point that out. All right. How, how many, tell me how many pages. Do you know how many pages is on this flash drive? Uh, 9,943. That's right. But, so, all right. We have a motion to approve uh, Whip Coomer and a second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor of approving the 10-year GDOT plan, say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right. It's approved. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda, we have Senate Bill 6, Mr. Whip, Steve Gooch. Is he in the building? He, uh, we'll get him to come in. This is, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and start and let you know that uh, our distinguished whip from the Senate had presented to us Senate Bill 6 at our last meeting. Uh, we have a similar measure that was also in the Senate Transportation Committee that passed out earlier this week with a Senate substitute, which basically went back to the Senate language. Uh, you have before you uh, Senate Bill 6, substitute to Senate Bill 6, LC 39167S6S, which virtually is similar to the bill that we passed out of this committee and out of the House. Uh, earlier in the session. I will point out a couple of changes on it um, under the appointees by the speaker and by the lieutenant governor. I'll look for the line. Um, lines 31. One of the things that we heard from the committee, uh, Representative Williams being one, is the need to, to look at rural areas of Georgia. So we increase the number of appointments by the lieutenant governor and the speaker to three. One of those members would come from a rural area of our state. We also uh, gave them two additional members each, which would be uh, non-members of uh, this uh, House or Senate, and those individuals would be representing a county or city with, that provides mass transportation. And that is, in, in essence, the changes, again, to what we voted out of this committee and passed the House. So. I'll be glad to answer any questions on that. Uh, I'm assuming that our posture would probably be to move this to, uh, if this passed this committee, we'll move it to rules, and then hopefully between the Senate and the House leadership, uh, we'll get a good resolution of this before the end of session. Any questions? All right, if not, you have the substitute to Senate Bill 6 in front of you. Do we have a motion? A move and a second to approve. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, that passes. All right. Um, suspend just one second. All right, we're we're gonna. <laughs> Chairman Satzler had another meeting he needed to be at, but Chairman Satzler and Chairman Harrell both have worked uh, along with, I know Representative Hanson and others on uh, the AV bill, which is um, Senate Bill 219. And we, you have a substitute to that bill that I want, uh, would like for <coughs> Chairman Satzler to be here to speak on. So we're gonna see if we can get him to come up. Um, I know Senator Gooch, have you saw, have you reviewed this legislation? All right, do you have a copy of it? Anita, if you would make sure, uh, Senator. <laughs> well, this is a sub to your bill. <laughs> oh, that's true. We'll, um, one of the things I do know is that there may be members of the industry here um, that I know they've reviewed this legislation, this proposed substitute. Um, 
while we're waiting on Chairman Satzler and when he comes, we'll get him to explain this legislation in detail to the committee. But uh, I would like to open it up at this time while we're waiting. If there's any member here of the public who would like to speak in opposition to the updated substitute, we'll be glad to hear that at this time. I know there might have been some questions around the insurance piece. So in, anyone that wishes to speak on this. So, all right, hearing none, we will uh, suspend just for a few moments until Chairman Setzler gets here, and then we will move forward and get this, uh, get this done. Yes, sir, go ahead. Um, to the good senator. Again, going back to hacking, hacking, if, you know, when you look at the uh, automated driving and, you know, it's internet, I guess it's gotta be internet related. Has there, has there been any more discussion about, on hacking and how many cases where they're currently doing it, there have been some hacking issues? Because that's a big deal now. Um, are the Russians in, in some way hacking? They are, they are listening to <laughs> Yeah, right here. <laughs> Is it a P3 project? <laughs> oh. The question needs probably needs to be addressed to the General Motors representative in the room and possibly Uber or Google that are in the room. All right. Uh, they're, they're here. Let's come up to the podium and uh, Representative Jones's question uh, goes around the issue of being able to hack or, or to be able to get access to these cars. So provide us some information. Yeah, uh, Eric Henning with uh, General Motors, and I'm not here to talk about bonds, uh, even though that did come up in the last discussion. Um, so I could talk about what General Motors is doing. We started almost three years ago a, um, a cybersecurity uh, department, basically, um, with the chief of cybersecurity. Um, instead of um, vehicles which, um, well, let me back up one thing. These cars are going to be self-contained, so they're not necessarily Internet-based um, in, in terms of what you're thinking. They're not controlled through the Internet. They're going to be, be self-contained vehicles. There may be some vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication on some of these things, but what we've done, and that's why we set up the cybersecurity department, because it's very important to us that we address hacking. Um, <clears throat> there have been some cases that have been hacking, but if you look at those cases, most of them have been not because somebody remotely doing it. It's actually been somebody that had physical access to the vehicle to plug into the ODB port and then try to control it that way. Now, it wasn't simple. It was done by teams of researchers that spent lots of money and lots of time being able to do it. So it wasn't a simple thing that occurred. But that's something that we take very seriously. So now when we are developing cars, we're developing cybersecurity into our cars from scratch rather than trying to retrofit what's already been there in the past. And that's why we set this up so that we could do this because there is gonna be more internet-based things in cars, um, whether it's infotainment, whether it's vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, um, all of those things are important. So, so for us, that's what we're doing and have taken it very seriously. I think we have 100 people now that are in that department that are actually working on this and helping to develop vehicles from scratch with cybersecurity and layers of defenses built in. Yeah, absolutely. Representative Jones, that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, I believe Chairman Setzler's here. Um, what number are you, Chairman? What number? Seven. <coughs> All right, go ahead, Chairman Setzler. Thank you. Um, did you want, I know we've got the, off, the house sponsor here as well, did you want me to make, talk to some issues in particular, sir? Yes, if you would, just talk us through the process that we've been through, how many variations of this legislation we've been through, how uh, the subcommittee worked with the industry, and uh, then we'll, between you and Representative Kelly, present the substitute that the members have in front of them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and, and forgive me, I was literally just walking out of Education Committee, we had a vote on a constitutional amendment there, I literally came straight there. From here from there. Um, SB 219 is part of a process that involved industry stakeholders, um, it involved the insurance industry, it involved the trial bar, um, and in a way, as, as we work through with this industry working group, um, one of the things we were really intent on making, hat, making sure was that, that entities, and I'll just say it plainly, forgive me for being this, this direct, you know, the, the auto manufacturers, rideshare companies, Technology providers in many states have been been fighting over this issue, and we were really committed to, to a consensus bill that we could get all those entities together in a room, not just folks locally but also national attorneys. We had we had conference calls at times that folks in 
in the Silicon Valley could be on with folks from Northern Virginia and, and Georgia to make sure that not just local representatives, but the lead corporate councils for these firms could be involved in reading this and f fashioning really virtually every word of this bill. So that was the process we took. We, we, we took. We've been through no less than 14 substitutes just among that industry working group. And when I say industry working group, I mean the industry representatives and um, interests such as the trial bar, insurance in industry. So those entities have all been engaged in this process to craft this. If some of the language looks um, wordy or convoluted, there, are, there is meaning behind virtually every word in this bill that I'd be glad to address in as much detail as, as the chair could stand. Um, what we've done, though, is try to nest this within, a, within the existing code, and um, I'd be prepared to answer questions on any part of this, as, as I know Representative Kelly would as well, who's part of this process. Representative Kelly. To take this opportunity, I, I'll be glad to answer any questions about the bill, but again, just take an opportunity to kind of just underscore some of the points that Chairman Sessler made. This is um, this has been a process, and uh, we've really tried to be inclusive on our process to get input from from everyone. And I think what we have here today does um, you know represent uh, something that the entire uh, every uh, interested party uh, is signed off on this. And 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 uh, where we're seeing other states have fights over these issues, uh, you know, we came up with a Georgia solution that I think is going to be taken. Uh, from outside our state lines and be used as a model for the rest of the nation. That's something I think we should all be proud of. All right, we have uh, number 26. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand every word in this, lang in this bill is now um, absolutely important. And I just refer, refer you to the very last sentence uh, on 140. That, does that mean if the city of Atlanta decides we don't want any autonomous vehicles, we wouldn't be able to make that decision? Chairman Satzler. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Um, the last sentence doesn't say that. No, I will tell you that is the effect. Um, in fact, if you look for statewide applicability, there's, the city of Atlanta does not have the power today to say that drivers over the age of 50 may not drive on our streets. Okay. Um, anything as, as crafted in Title 40 does have statewide applicability. Um, so that just by operation of how Title 40 works is the case. The last sentence of this bill, no rules or regulations relative to the operation of fully autonomous vehicles and so forth, that speaks to that there's no statewide agency that can perceive a, an authority to write rules if you remember the, the microbreweries, the craft brewery, we thought we answered that question as the legislature and the Department of Revenue, our dear friends there, saw it differently. In spite of the great agency they are, great leadership, there's just that. There's, we wanted to make it very clear that there's outside of um, areas that's clearly prescribed, there's not any perceived ability to regulate beyond what's contemplated in the bill of the power that's given them. Thank, Thank you. you for that explanation. Thank you. All right. We have Representative Jones. Yes, Mr. Chair, if there's not any more questions, I'd like to be recognized for a motion for the substitute. All right, just a moment. One of the things I want to uh, say at this time about this legislation and really the last one, we couple of last ones we've added, sometimes when you come to these committee members' or me minute meetings, you see uh, the operation of this body operate fairly quickly, but there's been hours and hours of work and meetings this went into making this bill a reality in the legislation you have in front of you. A lot of compromise on the industry's part and on the House and Senate's part in the same way with the CERTA legislation we had earlier. So I want to commend uh, the, this committee and commend this subcommittee. Representative Kelly's worked on this for two or three years now, starting with a, um, a project a couple years ago with a study committee that he chaired. Uh, has went and visited many locations and talked to dozens of individuals. So he's done a omen's work, and he also was gracious enough to tell this committee that he understood his bill was not going to be able to make it out of committee because we could not perfect it in time. And he uh, was gracious enough to say, let's let Senator Gooch's bill come over and let's continue the process. So it's not always about who gets the credit, but I want to take this opportunity to thank Representative Kelly uh, for his hard work over the three years he's worked on this issue and for the industry's help in making this a reality. Uh, uh, 
Chairman uh, Harrell and Chairman Setzler and the others who's worked on the subcommittee, so thank you. All right, we have number 23. Do you have a question? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was just going to echo that subcommittee, and I just wanted, uh, you know, Chairman Setzler and, and Representative um, Kelly, uh, appreciate the Senator for allowing us to use uh, his bill for the perfected language, but also serving on that subcommittee. Let me just recognize that Representative Hansen and uh, Representative Fry and, and Brian Prince, Representative Prince also uh, served there, and um, Representative Todd Jones, too. So uh, just for those of you that didn't serve on that subcommittee, I, to reiterate the point that it was a tremendous amount of work and many, many hours going on, and I appreciate very much the hard work and effort uh, put in. Very impressed with the work that uh, uh, you ladies and gentlemen did. So thank you. Thank you. All right, Representative Jones, do you have a motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. For, uh, I'd like to thank the subcommittee and Senator Gooch and uh, Captain Kurt Kelly, <laughs> who's about to take us into the future. You know, we're laughing about this on one hand, but it's, it, it is very serious. I remember watching the Jetsons, Jetsons as I was growing up, and we just laughed about it. But what we get ready to see happen in terms of Georgia going forward with technology um, you guys are really about to take us into the future. This is going to probably be one of the biggest innovations in technology improvements, uh, going back probably to the cell phone or some of the other um, innovations. Uh, I remember my dad said the first time he saw the plane was 1920s, and they were working in the fields, and he saw a plane. They start running towards the house. They thought it was some big bird coming to eat them. Um, and look at where we are now. So same thing. Thank you for all your hard work. And Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion due pass for the substitute of Senate Bill 219. I want to make sure I read it correctly. LC39168. I mean, one ERS. You got it right. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a motion and a second. Due pass, substitute to SB219, the LC number reference to any other discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor of signal by. Any opposed? All right. Um, we're going to put you down as the House uh, sponsor of this bill to carry this bill for Senator Gooch. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Chairman you. Assessor, all y'all's hard work. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Members of the committee, thank you, and we are adjourned.